All right. I think we're good. Welcome to get started. All right. So as uh, a lot of you may have noticed, my name is Nick Scola. I am a, uh, I guess I go to the, the fancy bio slide, right? Uh, I'm a former NYC VMUG leader. So I'm a New York native, recently relocated down to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I am currently a senior solutions engineer with Zerto, but I think I've probably held every single role that Paul is trying to fill right now at, at some point. Um, <laughs> I've been an in-house admin. I've been a IT director, I've done all kinds of roles. You know, I got into IT late nineties, um, you know, back when I was about eight years old No, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, but I started out, you know, like a lot of people did desktop support. I moved on to, you know, learning some windows NT. I was a uh, Cisco certified at, at one point. Um, basically CCMP, I took the written for the CCIE and never went past it. Um, then I, uh, I found VMware along the way and just kind of fell in love because it was a little bit of everything that I had done in the past. And, you know, I really enjoyed working on the technology. And I think the first time I saw a demo of uh, somebody playing pinball on Windows and then doing a V motion of that machine, I was like, what the heck just happened? That's amazing. Um, you know, so I kind of stuck with it for a long time after that. And uh, I think as Liz was mentioning earlier, uh, I did go ahead and get my VCIX. Um, I just have too many kids, so I never went around and actually did the uh, the VCDX. But at some point, I, you know, I may go down that road. Um, you can find me on Twitter and LinkedIn. I'm usually talking nonsense up there with a, a couple of folks that are on this call. And uh, I do blog, you know, twice a year, I'd say, um, at Spooky Solutions. A lot of it's either community focused, career focused. I do talk some technical stuff about Zerto every once in a while. And, uh, you know, you, you'll find a lot of my, I guess, previous presentations up there. So I'll try to, if there's recordings, I'll do a quick blog post to talk about them and, and throw it up there. And kind of to Paula's point earlier, um, I definitely believe in building your own personal brand because part of that is about your career career progression and you know what it is you want to do in life and I'll talk about All right, let me know when you're ready to roll it's just a matter of keeping a journal with some of the tasks you've, you've done in a year or, or whatever it may be. Um, totally worth it. And it, it definitely helps with those year end reviews that you know, a lot of in-house folks have to do. Um, you could definitely uh, just jot down some of those things because by the time the review process comes around, everybody forgets. So it's helpful to have a list. So disclaimer, these are kind of personal experiences and things that I've gone through. Um, I'd love to hear your stories. And, you know, like I said, let's do this happy Gilmore style. If you got something to say, you know, just say it. And as long as you're, uh, you know, not saying something mean to me, I'll, I'll answer your question. Um, always reach out. I'm, I'm available. I might not, you know, get back to you right away just cause I, I got too many kids, but uh, I'll always do what I can to help you out. And, you know, just really, just going to try and spread the love because, you know, I've gotten a lot out of VMUG. So I want to get back where I can. I, I don't think I'd be in the position that I'm in today, if not for VMUG. Um, so I, I want to try and pay it forward as much as I can. And, you know, some of these things, they've worked for me in my career. They may not work for you depending on what your role is and that's okay. Um, but, you know, as one of my, uh, my heroes said, absorb what is useful, discard what's useless and add what is specifically your own meaning, if, if you like it, just like in PowerShell, Russell, um, you know, if you see something that works in your environment, steal it, just, just take it, make it your own, you know, add your flavor, but definitely give credit where it's due because, you know, you want to make sure that the people that came up with it are, are getting a little love too. But, um, you know, take what you, you like and discard the rest. Like I've done that with Ben's scripts. <laughs> there you go. So I like to start with this slide just to get a feel for who I have in the room. And obviously this is a big virtual room, but what does everybody do? Like what's your job role? So we got a sysadmin in the chat. Ben, I believe you're a field SE, right? I'm a, I'm a well, professional services engineer. 
there we go. All right. So PS engineer. So you make stuff work. We got a bunch of windows and VMware admins. Beautiful consultants. Love it. Cloud engineer. All right. This is great. All right. So you'll see that I'm not going to be talking about one particular role or another. This is really going to be just kind of a high level overview of just some of the things to think about when you're going through. And a lot of this is going to be project based, which I think everybody kind of touches on at some point, you know, there's, there's big initiatives that need to get done. Um, and really not so much you need to do this, then do this, then do this, but just kind of have an idea in your head about certain things to just be, be aware of. Okay. Now, so my career before, if anybody remembers uh, Nick Burns, your company computer guy from SNL, uh, you know, helps that my name is Nick, but uh, I was that guy. I was such a douche. Um, you know, I was really, really good at my job. Um, I was very technical. If you had a problem, I would fix it, but I wasn't, I was just, I didn't want to be bothered with people. Maybe it's because I was a bit introverted. Um, but what I, I came to realize is that even though I was really good at my job, I had an oh shit moment, oh, sorry, an aha moment. And uh, that was basically where I was working with the gentleman. Uh, his name is Dan and we worked together at a very, very large hedge fund. And he was probably as good you know, as me technically. And, but he kicked my butt when it came to understanding the business. And I think that's where I really had the, the realization that like, if I wanted to move ahead past a certain point, I needed to get a better understanding on, on one, what it is my company did and how my role actually affected the company in a positive way. And not only that, at some point you need to be able to articulate it. And you can be really good and really successful at your job, you know, by going to work every day and doing what it is you're tasked with. But if you really want to get to that next level, and I, I look at it as basically moving from an engineer to an architect, right? If you want to be the person who's coming up with the designs and coming up with the plans, there are some ad additional considerations that you need to understand as you're going through this. And, you know, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit deeper, um, you know, as we move on. Now, part of this was that, you know, I was, like I said, super technical. I was taking every certification under sun. You know, I was a, CCNP, a CCDP, I was, uh, you know, MCSC, I, I mentioned VCIX, I, I had all these, uh, I AWS certified, all this nonsense, right? And not, not that I mean nonsense, you know, you didn't hear that list. Um, but I was doing the certifications in a way to learn the technology, which I think is kind of the way to approach it is if you're going to do something, go and learn the actual technology. Don't be so focused on passing a test, right? And I did that and made me very successful over time, but there were certain things that I was lacking, you know, as far as being able to present, being able to help un others understand the things that I knew, because I knew a lot. I just couldn't get other people to understand those things uh, in the same way. And because of that, you know, I struggled to get new technology in place. And once I kind of had that realization that I need to start broadening my horizons a little bit, I think my, my career started to change. And, you know, because of that, how many people, is there anyone that's very small team skeleton crew type environments where, you know, you're doing a lot with of not a lot of resources um, that, that sound familiar to anyone here? Very. Yeah. Okay. Cause I, you know, I, there was a couple a uh, couple stops along the way where I was the only person on the team and it was either because, oh, yeah, oh, Sean, yeah, I, I, trust me, I feel your pain, buddy. You know, I think when you're really good at your job, it, it can be a double-edged sword where people just depend on you for everything. And that's why I say it's really important to take the people around you and bring them up to your level. Because then you can go on vacation, you can, you know, get out of the office or, you know, split that load a little bit between you and other folks. Now, obviously, budgets are going to, play a role in that, but you need to understand that as well. All right. So what did my career look like afterward? Right. And this is where things definitely changed. And I got focused on more of the bigger picture in the environment. You know, I tried to take an interest in, you know, what it is the companies um, that I was working with did. And I think as 
you might have seen, or if any of you know me or have seen my LinkedIn, there's a lot of jobs on there. And I did bounce around a, a lot for a while. There was, there were some reasons, you know, hashtag reasons, but I can defend every move. And I had some of them were basically, I didn't want to be in a situation where I was the only person. And a couple of my really short stints were, I went into a position, was told one thing, things changed very rapidly. And I made a decision that, you know what, this is not the place for me, I'm going to move on. Um, and it was because I wanted to be part of a group and part of a team. Um, and Paul and Paul's going to throw some jobs up on the, uh, the chat, make sure that you're uh, keeping an eye on them. So what wound up happening also is I started to get a better understanding of what what the actual IT organization looked like, meaning what groups have to work together. Now, if you're in VMware, you work with a lot of folks, right? I'm sure you work with storage. You probably work with the Windows teams, Linux teams. You got to work with the networking team. And I know a few of you for sure have to go through uh, change request processes and there's tickets that need to be open to get anything done. And, you know, that brings in a whole other level of complexity, right? So knowing who to talk to, um, who's actually going to be able to get stuff done too, because that's another thing. It's knowing what group you need to talk to is important, but knowing who in that group can actually do stuff is just as important. Um, and really, as projects come up, you need to understand the business drivers for those projects, right? Why is this being done? And I'm going to go into this really old school, you know, eighth grade current event style, who, what, when, where, why, and how, and, you know, really kind of share that, um, that mentality with y'all. And see, I'm in the South now, I say y'all. But, uh, you know, <laughs> one of the other things I learned also was that it's the ability to now articulate what I, what I know and what I want to tell to people and be able to present it. So luckily now I have the ability and, and my role today, you know, cause I am a, a pre-sales engineer. I talk to a lot of customers. I have a couple, couple of customers on the, uh, the line right now and being able to get in front of them, articulate what it is that Zerto does. And then um, not only articulate what it is that Zerto does, but understand what it is that they're trying to do in their environment. So what is it that their company is trying to accomplish and can we help them? It's not just show up, Hey, you should buy Zerto. It's awesome. It's you have a challenge. I want to help you address that challenge because if you can do the thing that you're setting out to do, it's going to make you look better. You're probably going to say nice things about Zerto, which I appreciate. And then, you know, people inside the organization are going to know you. And I've, it happened to me when I was a customer. So I used to, I was be in house. I've worked with a lot of vendors, you know, EMC, pure storage, VMware, uh, Zerto, Rubrik. I, I mean, I, I had everything under the sun. And when I started kind of making this change in my career, it let me do things like go to a vendor's sales kickoff and present on why it is I bought their product. And not only why I bought their product, but what that did for me. And I'll never forget, I actually went out to a, a pure storage sales kickoff and I presented to their entire sales team. And I was, you know, my, it was literally like my first or second time presenting. I think it, I might've done my first presentation at a NYCV mug which if anyone caught that little line at the bottom of my bio slide, that's where that came from. I'll talk about that later. Um, but I get out in front of the room and I'm expecting, you know, 25, 30 people. And it was one of those like ballrooms where they had the divider in the middle and they had to open up the divider because there were so many people. And I got up on stage and was like, what the hell is going on here? Like, this is not for me. And, you know, I was actually prepared. I got up there and I did it. And I'll never forget this. And I don't think, you know, their president and CEO was ever going to forget it either is I ended my presentation with a picture of my then one-year-old son and basically said that because of this technology, I get to spend more time with this guy. And like literally the whole room started bawling. I mean, I'm getting a little bit clumped right now, but uh, you know, everybody starts kind of choking up a little bit, but like that's the impact that you have on your, not only your company, but on, your customers, your end users, things like that, because there's a, a tangible impact when it comes to 
if you do something right, they get to spend more time at home. They get to leave the office on time, right? If something breaks and there's an outage, you know, it's not just the IT team that's affected. Think about all the people that have to then go and recreate all the work that they've been working on all day, right? So just keep those things in the back of your mind when you're going about your day. It's not just about what I'm doing technically, you know, setting up a cluster and, you know, attaching storage and all. That's just a task. That That's not really the actual end goal. That's just a means to getting there. Okay. So understanding what it is you're doing and, and who it's going to impact is greatly important. All right. So let's get into the, the social studies, right? What are you doing? Like project comes up, you need to do something, right? It could be anything. It could just be, we need you to migrate a data center. We need you to uh, install a new version of, of software, right? One, is there a, a pain that you're trying to solve for, right? And what I mean by pain is, is there something happening in your company or in your environment that could be better, right? It could be a process. It could be something related to technology. It could be something that, you know, maybe your users are complaining about because something's been broken on and off for a certain period of time. There's a ton of, of reasons it could be out there, um, but something is happening that needs to be addressed. Now, I mentioned that, that hedge fund earlier, right? I had a situation where, and this is literally how I got into uh, Speak to Pure Storage. So I had a situation where we were having a storage problem and I was on a, a VMAX and my VMAX started hitting about 250 to 300 milliseconds of latency. And for anybody who deals with storage, I think you could kind of see where I'm going with this. Now, turns out that the uh, storage array that I was dealing with served a couple of SQL servers and I didn't know what they did. All I know is that we were having a storage problem. Dug a little deeper, and this is where I started making that transition to understanding the business a little bit more. I dug a little deeper and started asking, well, who owns these SQL servers? Good thing was I didn't actually have to go looking far because they were standing at my desk when the, the problem arose and, and wanted to know when it was going to be fixed as soon as possible. Because it turns out that the SQL servers used to spit out reports and those reports were handed off to these analysts and traders and they would use that information to manage people's money. A lot of money. We were the number three largest you know, public hedge fund at the time, 40 to 50 billion under management. So we're talking a ton of money because, you know, not only money being managed, but money that could be lost if they can't do their job. So started having some more conversations and really trying to get to the bottom of it. And we were able to get some band-aids here and there, but the problem still existed that the storage array we had could not handle what we were trying to do with it. Okay. Now I had a couple options spread things around, or I could just go and find another array that would actually do the job that I need to do based on what the performance was. So I went out, started speaking to pure storage, brought them in and, you know, once again, not an ad, it's just my experience. Um, brought them in, literally set up the exact same servers. I just cloned the VM, threw it on that array, went through the same processes, no issues. And the justification for it, you know, I, I know a lot of times trying to get a new product in the door can be tough because you have to go and talk to your, your boss who's got to talk to his boss, who's got to talk to somebody else's boss, who's got to talk to somebody who has money, right? And finding the person who has money is always, always fun because who likes to give up money? I mean, I, I don't know anybody who likes to give up money unless you're getting, you know, cool Legos like that. But at the end of the day, that's got to be done. You have to have those conversations. Now, when you're having those conversations, if you don't understand what it is you're trying to solve for, the conversation is not going anywhere. So just don't even, you know, try to breach it because if you can't articulate exactly what it is that you're trying to solve for and what that pain is, why bother? And, and that's just, you know, my perspective. Now, if it's just something where it's a, a simple task, like, Hey, I need you to create an AD user. Fine. I mean, you know what you're doing. You, you can take care of that, but I'm talking more larger scope and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, you know, the other thing is, what's the end state you're trying to get to, right? Where is it that we mentioned that you, there's something that needs to change in your environment, you're trying to get there. What is it going to take for you to get to that point? And 
you know, for anyone, and I'll probably go into this a little bit deeper, but think about the technology design framework. So, um, you know, Liz was mentioning those VCAP exams. I don't know anyone here who's taken the VCAP design or plans on taking it. There's a ton of discussion about the technology design process and understanding requirements and, and what the vision is and, and, and things like that. And I can't stress enough how important that stuff is. I mean, I still have my, my Paul McSherry book for VCAP 5 DCD that I read probably once every few months just to kind of refresh myself because it's something that's going to stay with you forever. And even if you're not going to take the exam, I highly recommend you, you read that book and shame on me for not putting it on my reading list. Um, but it's definitely, you know, worthwhile in helping to understand, you know, what it is you're trying to achieve. But I think when you're working on some of these projects, if you understand what that end state is and, and where it is you're trying to get to, it'll kind of help keep your eyes on the prize and, and really help you try to get to that, that, that promised land, you know, we'll, we'll call it. So along with what it is you're trying to do, um, you need to understand who's driving it right now. Another thing I found out is that just because something is going to make an IT person's life easier, it's not going to get it in the door. And I think I got somebody on the line that can uh, attest to that, right? Just because it makes sense and it will change a lot of, you know, processes and it'll make things easier. And it'll, you know, in the end, it'll probably save your cost, you know, save your company money. Um, you need to have the justification for it and, it needs to have somebody behind it that has the power to actually get it done. And by that, I mean, you probably need to have some kind of executive sponsorship. You need to have somebody who's fighting on your behalf saying, if we don't have this, we're either going to lose money or we're missing out on a ton of money that we can make as an organization or as a company. Um, and that's why typically a lot of those, you know, let's make it better projects, unless you can show a correlation to how it's going to, make the company money probably aren't going to, aren't going to happen, you know, unless you do it yourself. Um, so really just kind of have that. And it's funny because one of the things is I had somebody once tell me that if you align yourself to revenue, you'll be able to do anything in the world, no matter what it is. If you find a way to align what it is you're doing to making the company money, no one's ever going to say no, because once again, people like money and just, just kind of the way it is, um, you know, understand who it is, is asking for this work to be done. So if it's a, you know, mid-level manager that's asking you to do something, um, you know, think about where this ask lines up in your task of priorities and everything else that's going on in your environment, right? So you might have three other things you're working on and they're asking you to work on something that's completely unrelated. Um, you know, if it's going to, if it's like an emergency, like in the case of what I was talking about, where we have a storage problem that needs to get addressed, all my other projects go on hold because my traders can't actually do their job. So we're going to lose, you know, millions of dollars in revenue because of this, right? Um, you know, perfect example. I worked at a very large media company. Um, you know, you guys are familiar with Jersey Shore. You could probably figure out who. Um, we we had a application that dealt with commercials, right? So basically how people paid for ad time and how we, you know, kind of carved it up and sold it, right? This application was worth millions. I mean, we're talking six, seven figures a minute. So if it was down, there was a problem. So I was like, hey, um, we don't have any disaster recovery for this application. So if it goes down, we're kind of screwed. Like we're going back to the previous night's backup. And you start talking about things like, when you go to restore from a different point in time, it's not just like how quickly can I turn the application back on? It's how much data did I lose while this was happening? And I think that's the other, you know, thing to consider is when something goes down, not only can I get it up and working quickly, but how much data loss am I going to incur? And one of the reasons why I pushed Zerto, you know, we are sponsoring, so I'm going to throw a little plug in. Um, but my whole reasoning was, look, if this goes down, we lose millions of dollars because I knew what the application was because I talked to the app owner and I understood that this application here is, you know, something that is very important to the company making money. So when I said, Hey, I need to buy X amount of Zerto licenses, they're like, okay, problem here. Here's a PO go 
do what you got to do and go get it done and put it in place. And if you can have that compelling event and understand, you know, exactly why it is you're trying to get something done, it makes it, you know, a lot easier. Um, you know, and another thing along those lines, we're really, this might not be just a one-off kind of project where you need to get something done. It could just be your company has a strategy that they're trying to strive for. Right. I mean, everybody here, I'm, I'm sure if I asked for a show of hands, you know, anyone who said, Hey, uh, we need to move to the cloud. Nice and, nice and vague. You know, we're not going to give you, we're, we're just, we're moving to the cloud, whether it's AWS or Azure, VMware cloud and AWS, whatever, and just even cloud service provider, any of those type of, um, you know, workloads, it's being driven by a company strategy. Now, the overall company strategy might be we're trying to reduce, you know, capital expenses as opposed to operational expenses or, you know, whatever we, we want to get out of owning data centers or real estate, but there's a reason and there's a strategy behind doing something. So I think understanding what the overall strategy is and where your, your project and your work fits into that is going to be greatly important as well. Now, obviously, uh, Times are a little different. That's why I'm I'm not sitting there and getting ready to have some beers with you guys and, and gals. Um, I think uh, this whole COVID-19 thing has kind of put a wrench into a lot of organizations' plans, but that's another thing to consider, right? So think about all the projects that you had slated to do this year and everything that was going to happen from January to December. You had to do A, B, C, D, E, and G. Then COVID-19 hits and you say, oh man, we don't have VDI, right? And everything else goes on hold and that project takes priority because if you don't have VDI in place, your people can't work. Now, I'm sure a lot of companies were in a position where that wasn't a problem, but I guarantee there was a ton of other companies out there that needed to correct some situations and maybe address some, some scale issues and, and things like that. Because, you know, when you build an environment for maybe 25 to 30% use, and then you need a hundred percent use, it's a completely different scenario. And then you have to then go and reevaluate everything and, you know, really talk about what's going to take priority from a, is this going to affect a small, a small subset of my company or is it affecting everybody? And not only that, it could be something that maybe your customers are driving. Maybe they're so fed up with something, you know, think about we're, we're on a zoom meeting right now, right? As soon as uh, people found out that there was no encryption with zoom, they started yelling and they, they went on Twitter and Facebook and, you know, everywhere and started complaining publicly about the company. So they had to address it because there was a public outcry and you know, how long did it take for that patch to come out where now everything's encrypted end to end, you know? So there's, a lot of factors that go into who starts driving, you know, certain um, initiatives and things like that. So, you know, just having an understanding of who that is, is going to be important, um, you know, for getting projects done. All right. So this one's always fun. The, the, why are you doing this? So we all deal with VMware, right? Uh, I, I imagine that everybody here builds VMs, right? How many of you actually know what each VM does? Go ahead. I mean, there's got to be one of you that knows every single VM in your environment and what it does, right? <laughs> I just, I, this one, I, I said this once at a conference and it just like, poosh, I could like see the room basically their heads explode. But you know, that that's one of the other things. And part of what <laughs> I can't even answer for my whole life, you know, part of this understanding, right? How can you architect something if you don't know what it is you're trying to protect, right? If you don't know the applications and you don't know what it is that they do, yes, you can follow a VMware validated design, but does that design actually apply to your environment? You know, the term best practice is, is just that. It, it's a best practice for somebody, but it might not be a best practice for you. So you really need to understand the, the way that you're going to architect is going to be directly driven by what it is you're trying to accomplish. So knowing that goal and knowing what it is, like, do you need redundancy or not? You got a question? Oh, sorry. So, you know, and I, and I'll go back to the, um, you know, the, the ad sales example, right? So if I've got this application that I know I need to keep up at all times, or I need to be able to recover instantly with minimal downtime, you know, that's where, 
I know exactly why I'm doing something. Um, I know why I have to go and get this environment protected. And it's because at the end of the day, if I don't and it goes down, we're going to lose a lot of money, you know? And, and once again, the, the, the VCAP technical design process, you know, really understanding, um, what that process looks like. And you're never going to be a VCDX if you don't understand that inside and out. I, mean, I, I can't even tell you no matter what your job is, it's something that as soon as I learned it, it like changed my whole career. And I, I would greatly, um, you know, recommend that to anyone. So I'm sure Liz has a class for that as well. So it would definitely be, uh, be helpful here. Um, but, you know, with everything you're doing, there's going to be a business goal or, you know, in the, the sales world, we call it a positive business outcome, right? There is something that is going to be a tangible result to that business. And that's why we're trying to get something done. So buying Zerto isn't about, you know, having a new DR software. It's about reducing downtime. It's about giving people the ability to migrate between data centers or consolidate data centers or move to the cloud or there's so many different business reasons associated with it as opposed to just i need to replace srm because it's not working or or you know change out recover point or something like that um it, it's really the technical piece is one thing but it's really about what the the business goal is and why we're trying to do that and then understanding you know if you're going to save or make money um and then how is it really going to affect your your customers right if you do something let's say you're an in-house admin right and you make certain changes like for example i changed my my storage array from a vmax to pure and the reports that these analysts and, and traders used to get they were supposed to have them on their desk by seven o'clock right and because of the latency, they started coming in a little bit later, 7.15, 7.30, 7.45, you know, 8 o'clock, 8.15. Once they're into trading hours, I've got a, you know, basically red, red alert in my hands, right? Because of the technology change that we made, those reports that we had to kick off at basically 5 p.m. the night before, let them run all night, and then they would barely get into their, their desks, you know, as they got into the office, they were getting them in their hands, in their inbox, we started the reports at five o'clock. They started getting them at about 545 that same night. So they could actually prep for things on the way home and have an idea what was going to happen the next day on that, that same day's commute home. Or now we can start changing the way we did business. Instead of just doing one report at night, they started getting multiple. So they can get three or four copies throughout the night and now see how things were progressing. So there's definitely reasons outside of just what it is you're doing. Um, and I like the example, th there's a, there's a book called, um, get out of it while you can. Right. And they talk about person driving a car comes along, uh, you know, man and woman digging a dish, uh, digging a ditch and goes up to the man and says, Hey, uh, you know, what are you doing? Oh, we're digging a ditch. Oh, cool. Okay. Goes to the woman. Oh, what are you doing? Oh, we're building a hospital. You know, they're both working on the exact same thing, but she understood the whole overall process of what was going on and knew, yes, they're, they are physically right now digging a ditch, but that's part of a larger project to go ahead and, and you know, build this hospital and expand. So knowing exactly where you fit in and what your role is and how that's going to affect the overall project um, and, you know, what other dependencies are involved and things like that. You know, I like the... Um, we've all been through, I'm sure some VMware upgrades, right? It's never just a VMware upgrade. And I actually did a blog post about this a while back, just like a PSA, because I see more and more customers that forget everything that touches a vCenter, right? So think about it. You've got, you got Zerto, you got Veeam, you got Citrix, you've got every other thing that any kind of backup platform, any, you know, security platform that has to have access to vCenter. If that vCenter goes down, you just took down all these other applications as well, right? Um, same thing with like a SQL server. If you're going to upgrade a SQL server, how many applications are hitting databases that are on that box? So when you're going to go through your, your projects, you need to have an understanding of all the different components that are going to be affected. So if I know that I need to upgrade my vCenter and I want to go to say vSphere 7, do all the applications that I run in their current version support vSphere 7? Or do I need to go 
and upgrade those applications to a version that's backwards compatible and, and kind of get them done first before I can then upgrade vCenter. So there's other considerations to take into, into account. But I think if you understand the overall scope of a project and you have that, like if you just go ahead and upgrade from say 6.7 to 7.0, 7, that's easy. You can do that. But if you don't take a look at the overall environment, you know, you're going to have a situation where you're going to break things and not realize it. And then people are going to come screaming at you. So in the back of your mind, you, you need to just, you know, ask questions. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but if you're unsure, ask, and this is the perfect forum for doing it. And, you know, once again, I'll, I'll touch on that here in a second. This kind of hit home at all. Or are we, we, everybody kind of relating to some of the things we're talking about here? Let's see some head nodding. Okay, good. All right. So next one is, you know, when, when does it need to be done by? Um, you know, what's the timeline? Is there, is there a date that you're scheduled to have this done? You know, typically if you're in a large organization, I'm sure there's going to be a project manager and we all love project managers because they're, they're really eyes on the prize and they're very fun to work with. Um, but what's the penalty if you don't finish on time or in time? Um, you know, let's say you've got a lease with a data center and you're trying to get to the cloud, right? If you're not out of that data center by a specific date, do you have to pay a penalty? Do you have to renew your lease automatically? And, and I've been in a situation where we were working on a data center evacuation. And if we didn't finish by the date that we were supposed to finish by the lease automatically renewed for another year. And it was basically a sunk cost. So that's another one to really just kind of keep in the back of your mind. If you don't know what those penalties are, um, you know, you could be in a situation where things are going to be tough. Right now, another one is what else are, are there prerequisites? right? Is this the first step in a larger project, right? Do you need to upgrade vCenter in order to, or do you need to upgrade, you know, a Veeam or a Turbonomic or a Zerto or something like that in order to then be able to upgrade a vCenter, right? Knowing kind of how those dominoes are going to fall after the project is completed is going to be greatly important. Um, and not only that, but are there other departments that have things to do? So if we talk about a data center evacuation, right? So First step would probably be migrating the workloads off of that particular data center. So, or, or, or your vCenter in this environment. So I've done plenty of implementations where customers have used Zerto to literally just migrate VMs from one place to another to get them out of that environment. Once that's done, there's still a ton of other work that has to be done. You've got to unrack all the servers, you know, decommission anything that's in place. I'm sure there's storage arrays that need to get addressed, right? Physically tear down racks, you know, like, just moving out of a data center isn't as simple as, you know, getting the workloads off of that environment. It's all the other stuff that, that gets involved. So typically we would do stuff from an IT perspective and then you'd have facilities that would have to come in after us and then go about their projects and, and get that stuff done. So understanding the, those timelines is really important. And, you know, we talk about having a reverse timeline, right? So if you know what the, the end date is, start working backwards. All right. We have to be out by, December 1st. So it's going to take us six weeks to tear down the racks. So that puts us in mid October. All right. And we can't tear down the racks until we unrack the servers. That's going to take us another two weeks. So that's beginning of October. All right. Well, we can't unrack the servers until all the data is copied somewhere else. All right. Well, that's a six month project. So now we're looking at April. So, and all right, what if something goes wrong? We need to put in some buffers, right? So by doing that, you could start having a better understanding by working backwards about how long is this project actually going to take me? And then once you have the date, it's going to be by this date, always, 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 always under promise and over deliver. So if you think it's going to take you a year, it's going to take you a year and a half. Just, just saying, because you don't want to be the one who's kind of sit there, you know, sat there uh, holding the bag at the end when uh, things don't actually work. And, you know, why isn't this done by this date? You told us it was going to be done by this date. Um, you know, just give yourself a little bit of extra time because it's really important to, to have that buffer in there. All right. So, I mean, the where is a little bit different now, you know, obviously everything's probably going to be, it's, it's happening remotely because COVID yay. Um, but when I say where, is this a project that's local to your group 
or are there going to be other geographic locations involved, right? Are you going to have to work with the team overseas in Europe or maybe in a different office? Or is there, if you're doing something remotely, is there a, um, you know, remote hands at the colo provider or at your data center that's going to be needed to actually physically move cables or, or do anything like that, right? So understanding that is, is really important as well as understanding how many other groups are involved. Excuse me. So when we talk about um, VMware, right? We, we have network, we have storage, we have, we're basically kind of jack of all trades, but there's typically departments that, you know, work on those systems in other groups, right? What, who are the application owners of those VMs that we know everything about? Because once again, we're the VMware person. So we know everything about everything because that's what people expect. Um, but if you don't have that knowledge, right? Who else do you need to get involved? And are they in your time zone? Because that's, that's one that people forget all the time. It's like, oh, yeah, we're going to be working with the European team. Let's have a meeting at 3 p.m. It's like, there's, there's time differences, and we need to just kind of take into consideration that. Um, but those things can really play a part because if you don't think about them ahead of time and you don't have like a standing recurring meeting, now you're going to be scrambling and you're going to either be waking up really early or, or staying really late to have these conversations with people and understanding, you know, time off vacations. I mean, it's summer now. So this is that time of year where people go on vacations, you know, all the time. So trying to get a project done and, Oh yeah, well, Joe's gone for uh, two weeks. He's, he's, you know, in an Island because uh, he wanted to get away for a little bit. So, you know, we're not gonna be able to do that until he gets back. Well, this project's due in a week and a half and he's, he's not here. So who's going to pick up the slack. So really understanding those, those timelines and, and where people are based out of it and things like that. Um, greatly important. You know, and the other thing kind of related, kind of not, um, does anybody work in an organization where your company does a freeze? So I worked at a, a retail location, uh, a retail company, pretty large one, you know, and, from Black Friday, I would say, till about third week of January, we couldn't do anything. It was basically just like a kind of a, let's start thinking about what it is we're going to do and we're going to plan to plan, but like we're not going to get to actually touch anything unless it breaks because they didn't want to take a chance with anything going down, you know, during Black Friday because obviously Black Friday is probably 90% of their business. So those are other things to consider when you're going through these these projects. And, you know, I see it a lot with like, month end reporting, if you're in a public company, quarter end reporting, things like that. When you're getting to that, that time of year when things are gonna be um, critical to you know, providing to like the SEC or, or things like that, you need to be aware of it and, and really kind of get in front of it um, before moving forward. So, you know, next thing is we, we talked about the maintenance downtime window and things like that, but also understand when you do this, are there, people that are going to be affected in certain regions, certain, you know, now uh, we see a lot with like load balancers and CDNs and, and things like that, where a lot of our systems are globally redundant. So you can actually work on one, but it's still being served by some, something else. Um, just, just have an idea of, you know, what's going to be affected when you do this, where is it located? And if something goes wrong, how are you going to recover? All right. So here's the, the fun stuff, right? Um, how are you actually going to do the stuff that you need to do? Now we, we've talked about the, the why and the what and you know, all that, then you actually got to go and do it. Right. So first thing is, do you have everything you need? Like, do you need to go out and buy new software or do you need to get hardware? Is this something where I'm going to, I need to replace a storage array? Well, how long does it take for me to one, go through my process internally? Like, do I even know how I can buy something in my company? What's that approval process look like? Is there somebody above me that needs to actually get that done for me? Um, do I need to get my legal team involved, right? And how long is that going to take? Because as somebody who sells things, I can get through the process and show somebody the technical validation of why something's needed. We've done the business case. Everybody agrees, yes, we're going to do this. And then it goes to procurement. And that's where it's like a black hole. So anybody who's in sales can kind of attest to this. Like you could literally just have no idea. Like, well, it, it may finish by 
October, but probably not. Um, if you can get ahead and understand what that process looks like ahead of time, it's going to help you set expectations a lot better. And really expectations is a word that, you know, I think you need to really understand when it comes to this whole process is from a business perspective, just over communicate as much as you can, because the more people know what's going to happen, the better. Um, you know, same thing with hardware purchases, like there, there's going to be delivery times and things like that. Just, just take that into consideration as well. Um, the other thing that really, I think, jumps out at me is how is this going to change the way you do things? And what I mean by that is from an operations perspective, right? You have your, your people, your processes and everything documented and all that. What needs to be updated? Do you need to update your documentation? Is the way that a process takes place going to, going to change? So I'm working with a, a very, very large bank right now um, around, they want to change the way they do migrations. So I asked them, you know, what is it that you do to migrate, you know, workloads today? Well, we have these engineers overseas and they go through and, you know, we take a three day downtime window and they use VMware converter and they basically V to V these workloads from one host to another. Okay, cool. Wow. I mean, yeah, you could do that. That, 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 that's a way. Um, I was like, well, how many, how many of these can each engineer do in a three day window? He's like, well, typically it winds up being about, um, eight. Cool. That's great. <laughs> so as a Zerto guy, I'm like, yes, like, like I'm, I'm making a big sale here. Right. But at the end of the day, it's like, I need to understand why it is they did this. Right. So then I start, well, how many people do you have working on migrations at a single window? 30. Oh, but we just hired another 40. I'm like, so you've got 70 now, 70 times eight. Okay. That's 560. All right. So you could do 560 over a three day downtime window. They're like, yeah, how, well, how many can you migrate? I was like thousands with like one or two people. They're like what? And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, it's literally just select the VMs, tell them where you want to go and hit move. And it does it. And it was like, Psh. but now they have to start considering, all right, well, we have all this documentation written now. This is what the team knows. We have to train them. We have to explain to them what the new process is going to be and, and go through everything and really get them to understand, all right, well, you did it this way, but now we're going to do it this way. And then, you know, once again, because I, I had mentioned PowerShell, can you automate any of this, right? If you can, you should always automate. Please automate. Do it fast. Um, but can you take out the human error? Can you do this in a way that it's going to make things better for the next person, right? Um, you know, and to me, the how needs to include some kind of automation and it must, must, must include documentation. And I, I'm going to update my slide as soon as I get off with you guys because I need to include that because, you know, documentation is so huge because if you're the new person walking into a company, how do you get started? Where do you get started? And, you know, who's going to help you along the way? Um, you know, and then the question came up, you know, I, I was talking to somebody about, you know, understanding who's done this before, right? Do you have somebody you could reach out to um, that maybe has gone through this process and you're at a VMUG? So they're, they're, they're on the, the, the video chat right there. Um, you've got thousands of people on Twitter, on LinkedIn, in the VMUG groups. If you want to get perspective on what somebody's done, just ask. I mean, if you have a question about Zerto, I'm on Twitter and Squola, you know, S-C-U-O-L-A, not O-U, because people always spell it wrong. Um, <laughs> you have the ability to reach out, ask questions, and see what people have done. You know, somebody mentioned William Lamb before uh, about, you know, the, the home labs and stuff, right? You hit, you hit him up on Twitter or through his blog, he'll answer you. Well, might not be right away because he's probably got thousands of people asking him questions every day. But like, if you ask the right question, people will be more than willing to, you know, respond. And, you know, that's why I come back to VMUGS as often as I can, um, because I, I want to be able to have those conversations. And really, for me as a sales engineer, understanding what people are looking to do and, you know, why they're doing it is greatly important. So, oops, let's go back. So let's just say, we went through, we did the how, everything worked perfectly because you're awesome. Um, 
did you actually go and do the thing that you needed to do? Like, did you do it? Are you sure you did it? How did you verify that you did it? Did somebody go out and talk to the person who owns the application or your end user or customer? Part of the design process and part of understanding, you know, if you were successful is making sure that you accomplish the goal that you were setting out to do. Um, I, I love to pick on backups. And it's funny that you mentioned the thing that Melissa talks about recovery, because I always talk about recovery. And I presented at Zertocon, and I think Mike's on the line, and he heard me say this, and I think he quoted me once, because nobody gives a crap about backup. Nobody. Only people care about is restore. You know, does it matter if you back something up? No. When your backups are successful, does somebody come into your, your office and give you a pat in the back and say, hey, great job with that backup last night. That was awesome. Nobody gives a shit. It's about when something failed, and this is really understanding what the problem is that you're trying to solve with backup. The problem that you're trying to actually solve is if my data goes down, can I restore it? So to verify that you can restore it, or to verify that you solved the problem means that you need to go and have a successful restore when something goes down. So that's kind of, if you take anything from this entire and I know I've been flapping my gums for a while here, but if you take anything from this presentation, it's just remember that it's what was the actual problem or the business challenge that I needed to solve for. And after everything that I've done, did I actually solve it? And how can I prove it, validate it, and, you know, verify that it's done. Now, this process might not be just crossing a finish line. This might be something that's going to be an ongoing operation, right? It might be, you know, I'll pick on Ben because he's, he's just sitting there and looks so nice with those banners behind him. Um, Turbonomic, right? Turbonomic is a tool that, yes, or, or a platform. It's a platform you can use from a, I want to just use this one time to optimize some stuff, or you can use it on an ongoing basis and go back and, reinitiate, revalidate, you know, go through the process in, in a iterative manner where you're constantly checking, updating and optimizing. Okay. Understand that as well. So depending on what this is, is this something where it's a start to finish or is it start to here? And then once I get to that point, I need to go back and make sure that I'm still doing it the right way. Or is there a way that I could optimize it even further? Um, you know, quantifying the benefits, obviously, you know, going back and, you know, we kind of touched on this, but making sure that if you were going out to save money, did you actually save money? You know, and after you do something, go ahead and puff out your chest a little bit, you know, publicize it, tell everybody, go to the rooftop, scream about it, let everybody know that I did a thing. And I think that's one thing that not enough people do is that when you accomplish something, let people know about it. Because if you don't tell people that you did something, like, for example, I just built some scripts for Zerto, right? I went out and we have a process where we deploy an environment. You install your manager, you deploy some replication appliances, you license the site, then you pair the sites up, then you deploy, you know, it, all this, these steps to basically have a working Zerto environment. Well, it, it used to take me about an hour or so, start to finish. Um, my record was 37 minutes. I'm, but it was still too long and I, I just, I'm, I'm lazy. So I went ahead and I scripted the entire thing. I put it on our public GitHub um, and that's great. And I went from doing something that my record was 37 minutes to now it takes me about 12 minutes to stand up a whole Zerto environment, right? But what's the point? If other people within Zerto don't know how to use it and they don't know how it works, what does it matter? So I literally went to each SE manager and I told them about it and, you know, I kind of publicized the things that I did and, you know, at the end of the day, it's going to get more people using it. And it's also going to get me a little bit of recognition that I, I went and did a thing, which is great. But, you know, for you internally, if you do a great job and you publicize it and people know about it, it's going to lead to promotions. It's going to lead to more money. It's going to lead to Paula knocking on your door and be like, Hey, I got this position that you really, I, I need you for. So, you know, understand that and really understand that it's not just, what you're doing doesn't stop when the, the project finishes. It's, it's going to finish, you know, probably a few months after that. Okay. I know I'm getting got about 
five, six minutes left here. So, you know, just closing thoughts really. Um, not, I don't think anything I talked about was really hard and fast except for documenting. You have to document. Um, this is really just kind of a, a method or a framework that I, I use. Um, understanding how to prioritize is definitely important as well. Um, and, and I have a, a little bit of a reading list here that I, I would recommend and they've been helpful for me. Um, prioritization and understanding, you know, not just like, yes, I really want to work on this, but if I don't work on A, then I can't do B and I can't do C and, but wait, oh, there's D. And if I don't do D, the company's going to go underwater. So I, I probably should do that one first, right? That's going to be really important. Um, don't be afraid to ask for help. And you've got, you know, 31 people on the line right now that would be more than willing to help you, I think. Um, you know, except for me, because, you know, I'm, I'm, I got like 10 kids over here. So I'm kind of, kind of busy. I'm joking. Um, but, you know, don't be afraid to ask for help. Reach out and more than anything, you know, I definitely say plan for the future, you know, when you're going through some of this, these projects and, and some of this, these tasks that you're trying to accomplish, um, you know, think about what the impact's going to be. So how's this going to change your operations? How's this going to change the way you do business? You know, the example where I gave before where we cut the time it takes for a report from basically 12 hours down to 12 minutes, you know, now we can totally change the way that the business functions. They're used to getting this report once a day. If they can get it, multiple times throughout the working day. Now they can get better numbers. They can get more real time data. They can actually make educated, you know, and it give advice to their customers based on real data, as opposed to just kind of winging it, you know, you can't really wing it all the time unless you're giving a presentation at the Jersey VMO. Um, but you know, it, it's definitely think about the goal, the end goal. And, you know, not only that, but what's it going to lead to in some of those other, um, options that are going to be available, available to you at the end. Um, and definitely understanding your value in the organization. I can't stress this enough. Know what you do, know your importance. You know, when it comes down to, you have a, uh, somebody who's looking to fill a role and Keith Townsend did a great presentation on this at a VTUG and, you know, it, it really stuck with me, right? When he has two, uh, if there's a CIO or CTO that has two job recs on his desk, one for a DNS administrator and one for a VMware administrator, which one's more important and why, right? Well, they're, they're both, both these guys are asking for 150 K. Um, which one do I go with? You need to be able to articulate your value and what it is your job function does and why. And that's, if you don't know that, how are you going to be able to negotiate and how are you going to be able to get more money in the end? Um, and then always think like a customer, but more importantly, think like you're a customer, understand what's important to them understand, you know, how the work you do is going to affect them in a positive or a negative way. And I think if you have that in mind, it's definitely going to, uh, you know, increase your success down the road. Then uh, just kind of reading this stuff, Phoenix project, I think is important, even if you're not into DevOps or anything like that, but just understanding projects, timelines, priorities, things like that. Um, it's, and if anyone goes to spookysolutions.com, this presentation's up there with a video of it from VMworld, although I think I did a little better job today. Um, but the presentation's up there. I have reading recommendations. All that stuff is already on the blog. So I'll, I'll put that in the chat window here as well. Um, mindset is really a, a eye-opening around just how how to go about your, you know, your day-to-day, -day, um, just changing your way of thinking. It, it was definitely important for me. Uh, extreme ownership, you know, I'm a, former Marine. So, uh, you know, kind of near and dear to my heart, but it, it definitely, a lot of the, um, the principles that he talks about as far as just owning what, what it is you're doing really kind of comes into play here and make your bed just talks about, you know, how some of these tasks and accomplishing little things every day is really going to help you get going. Uh, gave the example with, uh, get out of it while you can and verbal judo is just a, another great one about just understanding how to have these communications. Um, you know, uh, while you're in the, the business world and, and things like that. So, and that, I mean, that's really all I got. So I just want to say, uh, you know, thank you to everybody. And, you know, thanks for uh, having me back. And it's great to see some familiar faces and, and, and people out there. And, uh, you know, if anyone has any questions, you know, hit me.
Thanks, Nick. That was awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Nick. All right. Does anyone have any questions? I don't see anything in the chat, but if anyone wants to uh, unmute themselves and ask a question, feel free. Awesome. So, yeah, you know what? Like I said, I'm sorry. Just let me know if my mic is bad. Nick, I was actually going to ask you a question. Like, we currently, right now, we replicate to a DR site that we have, a bunch of bare metal servers, and we're using uh, HCX for that. But we've been having difficulties with it because the, up, the upgrade cycles for it's been pretty aggressive. So, you know, it's been a lot of maintenance. We're doing more maintenance on our replications than we really should be you know, for a DR site. And they started, our vendor for our cloud was discussing possibilities we might look to an alternative, um, which would have been either Beam for the replication from the site, you know, from the on-prem up into the cloud or Zerto. Do you guys experience stuff like that for cloud um, DR sites? Yeah, so we can go uh, AWS, Azure, you know, Google. Um, the physical thing, I would recommend you probably P2V and then, um, cause we're going to work basically just for uh, virtual workloads and cloud workloads only. We're not going to yeah. cover the physicals. Um, yep. so if you can P2V them and then replicate them that way, I'd say go that route. Um, but everything that, I, you know, Zerto does, it works between VMware, Hyper-V, Azure, AWS, Google, you know, really any of those, uh, environments. And will it act like a, uh, like an SRM as well for the target side? like yep. react yep. and stuff like that with a playbook yep. so you don't yep. have to worry about that stuff okay that's yep. good to know yep. yeah it's a it's a complete physical environment most of our stuff i think we use like our pure or rubric uh -huh. i think uh ben you can probably correct me on this you know wilson probably got it from nick talking about those products because i know you used them for a long time yeah. um so everything's virtual right now we do about 20 25 vms but you never know if they're going to work you know and every time we do it's like oh you have to upgrade we're like we just yeah. upgrade three weeks ago if you're like your four cycles out so it's becoming more aggressive for us to maintain that gotcha hit me up i can i can, I can show you uh you know anything you want to see if you want to just kind of see i've got live labs and everything and can kind of walk you through yeah definitely i appreciate that yeah because yeah. i wanted to see the srm component like how it flips over on the other side because i know yeah. we've done some dr tests there was an awful lot of reconfiguring you know once we flipped it over not taking into account you got to change ips you got to do this you got to do that yeah. time consuming. Yep. Okay, thank you. Awesome, yeah, no problem. And so it's funny. So uh, Yvonne put in the hashtag mail model. So for anybody that caught it, um, in every one of my VMUG or V Brown bag presentations, I always put in my bio then a part-time mail model, kind of a Zoolander reference. But <laughs> the first presentation I ever did uh, for NYC VMUG, I put that in just because it was really the first time I got up on stage and I thought it would be a way for me to see if people were paying attention. And as soon as I got to the bio slide and I started going, I was about halfway through and then I started hearing people just start laughing and it kind of put me at ease. So I guess the other thing is, you know, anyone who's looking to get out there and present, um, just be yourself. You know, this is the way that, you know, I present is, is literally if I was out having a beer with you in the same kind of way. So just, uh, you know, you've got a unique perspective and don't, you know, be afraid to share it. And, I don't want to take, you know, any of uh, next presenters' time. So, but just leave you with you that. Can take my time. Totally fine, Nick. <laughs> How's it going, Mike? Yeah. So. Yeah. Awesome. Well, does anyone else have any questions for Nick? Okay. All right, thanks, everybody. I'm gonna well, have to drop because I gotta go go to my day job now. So, but thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. If anyone has any questions, you know, um, feel free to reach out to, to Nick on Twitter or um, uh, uh, or his email address or whatever. Uh, the information will be posted um, with this uh, video when the meeting's over. Um, and